Welcome to the MyLifeInConcert.com podcast. I'm your host, Various Artists, and please join me as I travel back and revisit every live show I've seen from 1975 to the present. We left Danceteria in the wee hours of Saturday morning, with the stimulants wearing off, our energy depleting, and the knowledge that we had to be checked out by 10 a.m. or so, which was just a few hours away. This is, what, three or four in the morning, something like that. So the artist and I, you know, we jumped in a taxi, headed home, got to the hotel, headed up to the room, opened the door, and... What the hell is going on? Hey, everybody, I'm your host, Various Artists, and welcome to the MyLifeInConcert.com podcast. I invite you to jump into the time machine with me for episode 30, concert numbers 23 and 24, as I look back on a crazy, insane few days in New York City in November 1983, when a group of us traveled to and partied in the Big Apple, taking in two very different live shows, with each being very wild in its own way. Come along with me and my merry group of 'er ne'er-do-wells as we take in two live shows in the city, The Circle Jerks at the Reggae Lounge, Wednesday, November 16th, and Psychic TV at Danceteria, Thursday, November 17th. Stay tuned for Destroyed Hotel Rooms, Terrified Cousins, Peace, Love, and Groove! Danceteria Bathroom Hallucinations, Brooke Shield's Husband, Broadway Bob, and Pterodactyls and Manifestations. And this episode is entitled, Back Against the Wall with Disco Pravity. As for the ticket prices for these shows, they have long been lost to history. Greetings, dear listeners, both new and returning, and thanks for tuning in. I quickly want to remind you all to check out the MyLifeInConcert.com website and blog chronicling this and many other shows that I've attended between 1975 and now, recording this in early 2023. With my original blog entries for these two shows that I write or wrote originally on OpenSalon.com uh, back in 2013 up on the MyLifeInConcert.com website. Now, with all of these entries, everything up there, there's additional features, well, this show and other shows, there's additional features such as extra information, photos, ephemera, links to videos, the original ticket, most of the time, uh, related Spotify playlists, and more. Now, in terms of the Spotify playlists, I don't have any new ones created just for this episode, but I have embedded... um, one playlist each from my punk garage atv etc series of six playlists plus there's a seventh master playlist uh into the two original respective blog entries uh namely for the circle jerks entry uh, i've got mlic prompt as all my uh spotify playlists start that way uh punk garage alt etc part three Punk, post-punk, new wave, alt and more, 1980 to 84. And with the Psychic TV entry, I've got MLIC Prompt, Punk, Garage, Alt, etc. Part 4, Punk, Alt, Indie and more, 1985 to 1990. And I mentioned, as again I mentioned earlier, there is a master playlist for all of these, uh, Punk, Garage, Alt, etc., spanning 1963 to the 2020s, covering all sorts of uh, genres falling under that vein, Uh, punk, garage, beat groups, proto-punk, psych rock, glam, pub rock, new wave, post-punk, alt, indie, grunge, punk-influenced songs, and more spanning that era. And they're on my Spotify playlist. You can follow me there. Also, please like, follow, and subscribe on our Facebook and Instagram pages, as well as our YouTube channel, uh, which features not only the podcast, but live footage that Cublet and I have shot at gigs through the years, plus vintage video clips. 
And remember to hit that notification bell for new episodes where applicable. Okay, dear listeners, back to the shows and to talking about this rather action-packed trip to New York City. Now, this episode combines two original blog entries, which I kind of alluded to, from mylifeinconcert.com, uh, namely Back Against the Wall for the Circle Jerks gig and Disco Pravity for the Psychic TV show. So in between the Bowie concert that I covered in episode 29B, Let's Dance, David Bowie with Rough Trade at CNE Stadium, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, Saturday, September 3rd, 1983. And for those of you who do listen to that, I announce it as being the Sunday night at the beginning. That's one of a couple of errors in the episode. Oh, well. So in between then and these shows, I spent a few months in between working in the kitchen of a restaurant slash dessert place that I'd previously enjoyed eating at and went on to enjoy later, but could not at this time because I hated working there, uh, owing to a few real jerks who I had as managers. So I stayed there for just a few months, enough time to build up money to take and go on this New York City trip and quit. Uh, when the journey came and what a journey it was start spreading the news at last i was on my way to new york leaving on this day to be part of it new york city had been my number one destination to visit for years owing to my longtime fascination with the city and its history especially as a flashpoint for transgression and cultural innovations. Andy Warhol, Lou Reed in the Velvet Underground, The Galleries, The Chelsea Hotel, Greenwich Village, Punk Rock, these vagabond shoes were longing to stray. Now, the trip was put together by uh, what was then the University of Western Ontario, now Western University, uh, the art department there, I should say, uh, where MZ, who has been mentioned in this series, was an art student. Now, in terms of who went down, it was a group of different students, but our group was myself, our pal, Miss B, who I've talked about in the Gang of Four, Beat, R.E.M., and David Bowie episodes. Uh, she came along. And MZ's significant other from the time, uh, who we'll call MP. So this is a tricky episode in terms of the aliases I, I, I give people because we've got MZ, MB, and MP. So listen closely and pay attention. All right. So we congregated on, uh, on the campus, at the campus, on a Wednesday evening alongside, say, a couple of dozen others who were going on this New York City trip. Now, we'd, been, we'd be driving through the dark of this cool late fall night with the eight to nine hour trip plopping us down in Manhattan in the early morning. Ahead lay almost four days of Gotham adventures before heading back around dinner hour on Saturday. Plenty of time to feast on the city with a side order of mischief. Upon boarding the bus, the four of us staked out a cluster of seats and discreetly tucked party favors into nooks and crannies uh, in the seats around us so as not to have anything on person should uh, anything come to light, uh, light when it was time to cross the border. And before you could say Needle Park Junkie, the Greyhounds strode out, strode out from campus and we left the driving to them. And Fred McMurray was nowhere to be seen. Now, the border crossing was really uneventful, thankfully. And after that, we just tried to catch some sleep, but it was very difficult. Because first off, I have a hard time sleeping in a moving vehicle, as plenty of other people do. But it was also the knowledge, the excitement that in a few hours we were going to be in New York and our day was starting, our trip was starting there. So we kind of maybe got drops of sleep and we all groggily rose with the sun 
squinting wearily at the dawn, assaulting the window panes. And we lifted our baggy eye slits wide to gaze at the grim eyesore that was urban New Jersey. Now, I haven't been through New Jersey since, but at the time, it looked pretty grim. Eventually, Jersey and gloom gave way to Manhattan splendor as we emerged from the tunnel. Finally, I was here, taking it all in for the first time. And as I was doing so, I kind of thought back to that scene uh, in Midnight Cowboy where Joe Buck is traveling to New York and it's that bit, you know, where underground, then they come up over the bridge and he's got the transistor radio um and as that come on it's sig they're on the on-ramp and he sees the panorama of the city so you know i kind of felt like i was in midnight cowboy for a moment you know minus the the prostitution and a tubercular dustin hoffman anyway the bus slunk through the bustling streets uh, sort of a during a midweek morning rush hour eventually slowly arriving in front of what was to be our home suite flea bag for the next few days the Executive Hotel at 237 Madison Avenue. It was around 8 or 9 in the morning, and when we got there, they said the rooms would not be ready until later in the day. So we all dropped off our luggage for safekeeping and went out exploring. Yep, there we went, our eyes bleary but agape, energized to simply be there. And okay, maybe there were some little black bennies that may have helped us <laughs> keep the uh, uh, empty gas tanks non-organically refilled for the day. I instantly loved the city's hum, strum, and energy. I can't really recall many specifics of that first day as I was half zombied, but I distinctly remember being struck by two things in particular. First, I was finally in a city where everyone paced at my speed. As someone who's always walked with a brisk gait and long-distance speed walking is one of the passions of my life and part of my exercise routine, it was simpatico love at first stride. The second thing was how friendly I found everyone. You know, there's always this thing from people about, oh, New Yorkers are cold. You know, I find that those threading around us as they went about their business at a determined clip, if you, we found if you approach someone and ask for directions or information, they would routinely stop and generously give more than a few moments of their time. Uh, it seemed to us that there were many who were very willing to be helpful New Yorkers and seemed to relish acting as city hosts when, you know, proffered to do so, you know, in sh sharp contrast to the whole reputation New Yorkers have as cold and indifferent. Now, of course, that shouldn't have surprised me. You know, as a terminal outsider, something I discussed at length in the previous Bowie episode, uh, well, the uh, 29A, more about Bowie, the 70s, and mean. Uh, boy, Sevies and me. Did I say mean? Mean? Me. Anyway, I've always found the social mix of cities welcoming. Well, cities are welcoming places to me versus the received notion of small homey towns as the be all end all of welcoming friendliness. Yeah, that's the case as long as you fit neatly within certain limited parameters. A factoid that often gets left out of those sort of oh everyone's so nice in those places yeah you know because others and other types of people they don't count right you know and returning to new york city it's the same i find new yorkers are really friendly not cute and pert and they're not necessarily looking to hang out and have a 10 minute conversation but generally i find people helpful there so day one was spent just taking it all in stitching through a constant human patchwork on the move. 
Why, for all we know, we could have been walking right past an aged Don Draper or Roger Sterling on their way to a morning AA meeting. Or perhaps Peggy Olson, high-stepping it towards another day at her own agency in a power pantsuit. Eventually, late afternoon beckoned, as did putting our feet up, and back to the hotel we headed to retrieve our luggage, and then take five in our designated rooms. Now, we were chuffed to discover a mini-mart of sorts right across the street with basic food, and even more important uh, to us at that time, alcohol. Uh, I was particularly pleased that the store sold Guinness, of which I grabbed a few before heading over to the hotel. And even now, I so rarely drink these days. If I go out, I may, I may have one drink. You know, I might have a glass of red wine with dinner, with a nice meal, and maybe if I'm going to see a band at the Richmond, I'll have maybe one drink, but it's still usually a Guinness. Um, that, is, uh, that is still my beer libation of choice. Now, we had assumed that because we had signed up together, we would be put in rooms together or people would be coupled with people that they traveled with, and we were highly unimpressed uh, to learn that we had been split up into all sorts of rooms with other people. Now, I checked into my room to discover that I'd been put in this multi-bed space with a couple of doofy guys, just jerks, who were inexplicably, inexplicably irked that I was drinking Guinness. You're drinking stout? You're drinking stout? You're drinking stout? What a bunch of stupid heads. Anyway, meanwhile, down in her cell, Miss B immediately uh, began working on teasing out her bleach blonde hair. Well, you would, wouldn't you, when you arrive in New York? Uh, mortifying the slip of a lass she'd been saddled with, describing her to me as kind of waiting horrified and doe-eyed uh, just outside the door until she could get in to plug in her sacred curling iron. Uh, there's no way these arrangements were going to fly. Um, and I honestly cannot remember what happened, how it happened. I have no recollection of the bridge between that and what happens next. But all I remember is that in short order, all four of us were sitting in the living room of a top floor suite. The two other guys on the trip had locked into now. One was a fellow student of uh, MZ. She was, he was in the art program along with her, who she kind of, sort of knew a wee bit. Not really, but they kind of knew each other a bit. And I will be calling him the artist for the rest of this episode. And he's actually coming up in a show, in a compilation episode, where I'll be looking at a 999 gig. Um, and he had brought along a good buddy of his who wasn't a student, uh, from, he, they're both from Toronto, but of course the artist was uh, in London going to school at UWO and this friend of his came down and tagged along on the trip and his friends, his own nickname by his own, um, choice was sky. Well, he later chose it anyway we'll get to that in a later and it's not the same sky sky sylvain who will be coming up in the next episode on ub40 different sky so unlike the troglodytes and the guinness averse room of yore artist and sky were great folks who were up for fun company on the trip so they offered uh, they offered us you know that we could uh, sleep on the fold-out couches and chairs or whatever if we wanted to crash in the living room, provided that they each got to keep their own beds in the other room. It was a deal. This worked for me. So for the next few days, myself and Miss B camped out in their living room while M and M alternated between spending their hotel time hanging out in the suite. Um, but also crashing in the commute, but also crashing, um, they crashed the first night, but they were stayed down in MZ's room the other night. And actually for about a half of the trip, we kind of were separated. As you'll see, there's one day and a half where we're really, it was the four of us and, uh, MZ and MB wasn't really involved in what we were doing. 
so now we had an established base, beer in the fridge, sustenance from across the street. Uh, one thing I really remember was Sky went and bought a whole side of ham. And, of course, we had a fridge in the room, and he just economically kept tucking into this side of ham through the, through the whole few days. And so once everything was sorted, we looked into, okay, what's the focus for the first night on the town? So we poured through the Village Voice, and it was agreed by committee that we'd be heading to Soho to see L.A. hardcore titans, the Circle Jerks, at the Reggae Lounge. Now, I've already talked about this in previous episodes. Hardcore was never a big thing for me. But, you know, two or three hardcore songs, and I'm done, and they all sounded the same. But it was a key, you know, one of the key underground musics du jour, and was always part of the mix, you know, when hanging out with friends. Uh, Miss B particularly was a huge hardcore fan. Um, and it was... An, I used to listen to MZ's radio show. This is I wasn't on CHRW uh, yet, and that and she'd always play hardcore, and you'd hear it in the bars, and there was hardcore bands, so it was around, even if I wasn't a huge fan. So you know, again, then as now, I don't mind a, a, a morsel uh, of hardcore uh, at the right time and place, but. However, I was curious to take in an actual gig with a mosh pit which is something we hadn't seen. And we, I hadn't been to a proper New York City hard sh hardcore show. So even if I wasn't into the tunes, I was into having the experience and all that. So following, I think we kind of crashed out for a while, sort of woke up, did some pre-gig prepping where there was much communal delight when I pulled out some aforementioned or, or, or uh, referred to shrubbery, and we skinned up and got dolled down in our ragged, non-finest, and off we went. Now, once we got down into the lobby and were about to go out and hail a cab, Miss B chanced to run into a cousin of hers. She had been on this same trip and they somehow missed each other on the bus and that sort of thing. Now, the two of them weren't overly close, but they liked each other, and it was a warm greeting. And she asked, okay, she was kind of going down and wanted to go out, but she was on her own, was saying, okay, so what are you guys doing? You guys are all heading out. And um, Miss B explained to her that we were going to go see a band. And she's like, oh, can I come along? Um, you know, sort of said in this very sort of peppy, you know, sort of a Sandy Duncan level of perkiness. And, you know, Miss B hummed and hobbed diplomatically, you know, telling her cousin that, you know, the show might be a little wild, but Sandy Duncan could not be persuaded to stay home and cross-stitch. And so it was that six became seven for the evening with perky cousin tagging along, all wide-eyed and jazz-handed. Well, maybe not. That's kind of, that's my mind, my, just my imagination running away with me. But she definitely was perky. Because I, I, Miss B was saying, oh, man, like she kind of pulled us to, aside and went, this is a really bad idea. Um, you know, this really was not her cousin's element. And she was sort of saying that, you know, she really liked her cousin. She's a very nice person. Um, but this, you know, she was a bit naive to this kind of a world and this kind of thing, as most people were at that time. And she's, she really didn't have a clue what she was getting into. So she was saying, look, guys, can we all just kind of keep an eye on her? You know, and, and fair enough. So stepping out into the chilly November air, we decided that a single cab wasn't going to willingly pick all of us up. You know, we could have taken two, but I guess that kind of advanced thinking was a little bit beyond what we could muster uh, or strategizing of what we could muster at that particular moment. And so Sky did the honors by flagging down a cab, uh, a cab, I said cow, that was like a combination of cow and cab, cowb, 
what accent would that be? Anyway, we flagged down a cab uh, uh, and, you know, we stood out of view. And then when he, when the cab showed up, we all crammed in five of us in the back and Sky and the artist up front with the driver. And Mr. Cab Driver was instantly and totally, understandably, pissed at this situation, bitching loudly on the trip over about how he could be busted for having so many people in the car. Yeah, and fair enough. Now, I mean, I, now I look at this at my older self and going, you guys were jerks, but <laughs> live and learn, especially when you're younger. Uh, now, luckily, Sky sat next to cabbie and he could have the gift of the gab so he was turning on the smarm and charm for the duration of the trip albeit with poor results so we didn't really know how long it would be the distance we didn't know the outlay we were going to soho we didn't know how much the cab would cost uh so we each had um one dollar ready to give the cab driver and when this moving auto jar of sardines pulled up to the club, we gave the driver each of our $7 at the ready for what turned out to be a $3 charge. Now, in 2023 U.S. Do current dollars, that means we gave him a $12 tip on a $9 fare. Incredibly, his entire countenance turned on a dime at this point. And it then became like, if you want to be driven anywhere when you're here, get a hold of me. I'll take you. No problem. You can all climb in. Here's your card. Give me a call. So anyway, um, so we went into the reggae lounge and I recall it as being like an old dance hall from like earlier in the century, holding maybe a few hundred to a thousand people could maybe and maybe 500 to a thousand something like that i remember it being pretty sizable with a stage at the far end in front of this huge just open space with a gallery up top and a whole arrangement of seats it was either seats or ledges that went around the perimeter of the club uh, right up against the walls and there were two distinct but easily coexisting groups present. On one hand, there were a lot of Rastas that were there to dance to reggae, and that's what they were playing, pumping out of the sound system. So you had the Rastas there, and then you also had punks and skinheads making the scene for the live show. So we entered, uh, when we entered, it was pretty much an entire dance floor of dreadlock males. I don't think I even remember any females on the dance floor. It was all males skanking to like a bottom heavy sound system, really nice sound system um, with this sort of like ribbon of punks of skids, punks and skins that sort of sat chilling around the perimeter awaiting the carnage. Now, the rest of our magnanimous seven decided to grab a brew and snake off to the sidelines with the others. But the artist and I decided to hit the dance floor. Now, it turns out that the artist, aside from being a huge jazz fan, was into a lot of groove-based music, as I was, including reggae. And we wanted to jump in and join the gang. So we were like two pasty white guys in a sea of bouncing dreads. Um, and we had a great time and, uh, a few of them, one guy where we were, was passing around a joint that probably wasn't any bigger than a shoe. And eventually it made its way over to us and was very friendly, uh, friendly offered to us, uh, through the crowd. So I have this really distinct memory of the evening. The other thing was one of the songs they played which ended up being a motif for me on this trip. And it's Gregory Isaac's Night Nurse. Now, it had been one of my favorite reggae tracks of that year or any year. It's one of my favorite reggae numbers. Um, and I had, I had the album, and I was verklempt in my deep weed state when the opening notes of the tune flooded the air. And it's interesting, as I said, I always associate this song with this trip because i kept hearing it in different places throughout the weekend and when heading to new york city 
I wouldn't have necessarily thought of reggae as one of the main sort of musics of the city, but um, here it was, his sexy plaintive number repeatedly punctuating my, you know, my few days visiting there. So what a great first night to be on the dance floor. The tunes are amazing. Again, everyone's really friendly, just fantastic, fantastic night. My idea of a great night. So a few more numbers on and the sound system went down. Um, and the, uh, 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 and it faded sharply as the Rasta skinhead rotation do si doed at this punky reggae party with the dreads now taking over the wall seats and the leather, uh, leathered and studded Mohican punks now swarming the floor as the circle jerks began making their way to the stage. Now the circle jerks had rid- risen from the same LA scene that produced black flag, you know, where, a two and a half minute song was seen as being pretentious on a Rick Wakeman's six lives of Henry the eighth type level. Uh, and indeed the circle jerks debut album group sex sported 14 songs in 15 minutes. Now the shows were notoriously coupled with some of the roughest and most aggressive mosh pit action of the day. Now, correctly surmising that we were going to be, that it was going to be intense and with nowhere left to sit on the packed main floor, we decided to candy ass it upstairs and watch it from the balcony. So this was the first genuine mosh pit any of us had ever seen. I'd seen lots of wild dance floors, but not a mosh pit. So since most of us had come out of the punk community, again, we'd been in lots of energized, but not necessarily violent sort of settings. You know, it was more front of the stage pogoing and flailing around, but this was something else altogether. Now, while stage diving, crowd surfing and body slamming are about as radical as a cup of Earl Grey tea and a shortbread these days, Okay, back then, this was pretty out there. Um, You know, we're 40 years ago now. And even having witnessed and sometimes been part of mosh pits and shows through the years, this one, it it just kind of seemed, in my mind, it was like a soccer soccer brawl to music. So from the moment the jerks took the stage, it was an instant human smash and mash with a holy doodles look from our provincial eyes. I couldn't tell you anything about what the CJs played because, again, most hardcore just sounds the same to me. So I'll just guesstimate that they played, you know, 100 tunes in 25 minutes or something like that. Um, You know, by comparison, the audience moves from the Iggy pop crowd from a year ago which I've covered in episode 20 and if you haven't heard that one I strongly recommend it and also you know I mean the 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 moves at the Iggy show was more like hepped up quadrilles Uh, and the flipper gig from a few months previously um, it was more like a pinochle tournament but you know by comparison and that's episode 25 that's another fun one so After a period of taking in the young hormonal morass of slam dancers with red, red robin mohawks, bob, bob, bobbing along uh, above the heads of the flailing limb crowd like a percolating pit of past the potato punk pinatas, something suddenly occurred to one of us. Where was Miss P's cousin? She'd been with us downstairs. And the crew assumed we'd all stayed together and migrated up to the balcony all as one. But suddenly it's like, where is she? She's nowhere to be seen. Now, you know, we certainly had, you know, we didn't try to ditch her or anything, but somehow she must have missed the memo that we were heading up to the second level, which meant that little Sandy Duncan was down there somewhere all on her own, among the warring gladiators whoopsie daisy it's funny to talk about this now but we were anything but laughing at the time you know while we all had twisted and sometimes you know dark senses of humor and sometimes played tricks on each other 
we weren't inherently mean. We weren't jerks. We felt like, you know, we'd been entrusted to look after our kid sister only to find that we'd neglectfully let her slip into the hands of the Manson family. So anyway, the, the moment the circle jerks fled the stage, we headed back down. Notice that we didn't go earlier. Anyway, headed back down and found the poor thing terrified out of her wits. She'd somehow lost sight of us and there were no breadcrumbs to follow. So finding herself wandering the battlefield in search of us, just as the CJs and their audience hit liftoff, she hastily scampered to the rear of the crowd, pinning her back against the wall so thoroughly she probably almost merged with it. So, anyway, having collected cousin, uh, uh, cousin, Miss, Miss B's cousin, we split a couple of cabs back to the executive post show. See, our thinking had evolved in that time. Um, with cousin B quickly severing herself, uh, from us group of no good, no good nicks for the rest of the weekend. Um, Sandy Duncan spent the rest of the time speedily avoiding us if she so much as saw us coming down a hallway, um, sort of avoiding us as one might avoid uh, a vindictive cyclops with Legionnaire's disease. So back in the sea, uh, back in the suite, after a long day with little sleep, and we just had that power nap earlier. We were all exhausted, yet far too wired on circumstances, substances, and each other's company for a good night, John boy, anytime soon. Instead, we threw on some music, spending hours into dawn, talking, joking, drinking, and toking until we all noticed the sun was rising. Each camp spent those hours getting to better know the other, all of us hitting it off like a house on fire, before all six found somewhere to pass out and venture deep into the land of Nod, dreaming wistfully of degenerate behavior ahead. Day one, mission accomplished, a success. Day two in New York City extended our vampiric existence as none of us awoke until just before the late afternoon sun was heading down. At some point, M&M decamped down to the temporary house of Zeppelin, the room that she had, with the intent that they'd be joining us later in the evening for tonight's event, which I was particularly excited about. Post-throbbing gristle offshoot Psychic TV, performing at the hottest nightclub in the city at that time, Danceteria. Eventually, the party restarted among this new gang of four, not so solemnly wor uh, setting to work on getting our shine on and glowing brightly before heading out for night number two, as Eminem decided not to go out. Why anyone would sit in a hotel room in your early 20s while visiting New York is a mystery to me, but a uh, mystery to all of us, but there you go. A spliff did the rounds to shake out the cobwebs as cold ones were cracked and imbibed, except in Skye's case. As I had learned during the previous night, he was an avowed alcohol abstainer, but loved the green stuff and other select stimulants mightily. And while he had left his Mary Jane back at home to curl up and have a rest in a drawer, he did bring along a bag of homemade cookies as a treat. Except that these cookies were more like chocolate hockey pucks rather than anything the Keebler elves may have whipped up. And instead of those lovin' from the oven nibbly baked goods being enriched with thiamine, niacin, or riboflavin, they instead had a different kind of secret ingredient, psilocybin. Yep, Sky had come down with about a half a dozen chocolatey-flavored magic mushroom cookies. And there was much rejoicing. Okay, so Sky kindly and thoughtfully shared his homemade bounty with each of us as we dove into Sky's biscuits of enchantment, um, which certainly would have won best in show at a magic bake sale. With the filling being mushroom heavy, they tasted 
awful, although the chocolate went a long way towards making them palatable, proving Mary Poppins' assertion that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Of course, only our own little Betty Crocker knew how much of the vitamin P resided in each nougaty product. But within about an hour, it became clear to each of us that he'd packed plenty into this rich snack. Uh, you know, those familiar, everything is somewhat surreal, and my, the colors are intense and electric. Uh, those feelings came uh, with the psychedelics gradually engulfing us, and the evening began. The quartet spent a couple of hours chatting, laughing, and otherwise boarding the train's ride prior to heading out. But before we did, there came a knock on the door. Now, I, I, I think of it, we didn't even look to see who was there. We just opened it because probably we were that obliterated. But we just assumed it was the hotel Maybe because we figured, oh, God, we're probably being too loud. They're telling us to quiet down. Fair enough. And we open the door, and instead, it's this guy. And Mr. Doorknocker says, I heard someone yelling in this room and thought it might have been a friend of mine. And it, as it turns out, of course, it wasn't his friend that he heard yelling, um, but instead just found four of us in the throes of some serious tripping. So, of course, we just asked this total stranger in to join us, as you would. Um, and he entered, took a seat, uh, and introduced himself as Marcel. And he confirmed that he was part of, his, part of the journey down from Londonia. Again, there were many on the bus. I mean, I mean, Miss B, Mr. Cousin, you know? So it's easy to miss people. There was a number of us. Now, on one hand, it must have been very weird for Marcel to wander in and join <laughs> this lot as we were all seriously silly and flying the friendly skies at this point flying hard and on the other hand you know what the hell was somebody doing knocking on a hotel door saying i heard my friend yelling uh and then just wandering in to break bread with a group group of massively stoned strangers you know who were too out there to fully compute this stream of logic in the moment um, you know, would you do that in a state of pure sobriety? I'm edging towards the no option on that one. Why did we let him in? Well, I know why. Anyway, but in short order, we told him about our plans to head out to see Psychic TV at Danceteria and let him know that four could become five, but he declined joining the gang and departed for tonight. Anyway, trust me, he'll be back. So... We eventually found it within ourselves to amble down to Madison Avenue, pile into the newspaper taxi that appeared on the shore, climbing into the back with our head in the clouds, waiting to take us for a delightfully funzy time with Psychic TV's Genesis P and the crew at Danceteria. Now, this was a club. Danceteria was utterly brilliant, a four-story funhouse that was exactly what the doctor ordered, especially if he'd been Dr. Robert. So the main level had a stage with a dance floor, um, a dance floor area, and that was the main performance area for live music. While the second uh, or I can't remember which floor is which, but I think it was the second was devoted to just completely being a dance place, a dance space with a DJ and a dance room. The top floor was more of a smaller performance art type area with the third in between is more of a chill out space with video screens anywhere. That's how I remember it. Maybe I'm getting bits wrong, but this is how I remember it. It was true high 80s excess in all the right ways in terms of look and vibe and this is exactly what i had come to new york city for and it's still probably the most amazing club i've ever visited 
I can't imagine a better place to be while tripping heavily on the chocolate mushrooms we'd gobble down. Now, Psychic TV were an offshoot of the deceased throbbing gristle, those wreckers of Western civilization, as they were called by a Tory MP in the 70s. And that inaugural, and you know, the inaugural purveyors of what would later be called industrial music, as per the name of their self run indie label and their approach to the sounds they created. Now, Throbbing Gristle themselves grew out of the controversial art collective Coombe Transmissions from, for, from north of England Way, started by then couple Genesis P. Orridge and Cozy Fanny Tootie. Coombe's apex was their infamous prostitution show at the ICA in 1976. It caused a major uproar in the UK, with Tory MPs getting their knickers in a right twist over the graphic content. You know, that's nothing's changed. Actually, <laughs> they get their knickers in a twist over far less now. Uh, and that's where that initial records of civilization came from. I don't want to look up the MP's name because he's best forgotten. Um, so yeah, so yeah, you had these conservatives getting their knickers in a right twist where Cozy, on the other hand, simply got rid of hers, uh, for many of the more explicit shots. Now the prostitution show launched a media scandal that was in many ways a trial run for what was going to follow just shortly thereafter, uh, with the sex pistols on the Bill Grundy show and punk rock outrage in general. I actually remember reading about this in the paper, uh, the London Free Press, uh, about this show and really being interested. Anything to do with transgressive art or artists always struck a chord for me. Um, but it's interesting because it wasn't until many years later that I made the connection that that art show was sort of the embryo of what became Throbbing Gristle. Um, Coom um, became Throbbing Gristle. I didn't figure that out till years later. Now, Throbbing Gristle was created as a sound, sound focus metamorphosis from Coom's conceptual performance art with Chris Carter and Peter Christofferson, also and better known as Sleazy, completing the lineup along with Genesis and Cozy. Now, while Throbbing Gristle intersected with punk's love of provocation, noise, and do-it-yourself aesthetics, their music was a different beast altogether, often abrasive, disturbing, and confrontational in ways that really wouldn't be commonplace until after the rise of the more experimental post-punk era. So, you know, you know, back then they, and even then they stood out as lone wolves with often anti-music created from a di desire to see how far they could push an audience. Also, stylistically, their palette was far more expansive than the punk of the day for, you know, it included, you know, on one hand blasts of white noise like subhuman, um, which again was not really in terms of what a lot of people thought of was punk rock. It's just more of a blast of white noise. Um, but, you know, grotesqueries like Hamburger Lady, they were more eerie than irked. Um, and then there were the proto-indie club tracks like Hot on the Heels of Love or, you know, or the Tesco Disco, as they called it. Uh, the Tesco Disco Doom March of United, uh, one of my favorite singles of the 70s. I love that track. Now... They were ultimately undone by that most unradical art esque of circumstances, an affair, and the resultant uh, dissolving of personal relationships when Cozy left Genesis P for Carter, effectively turning Throbbing Gristle into the Fleetwood Mac of industrial angst. Uh, now, a couple of years ago, Cozy wrote a brilliant, brilliant book. Uh, art, Sex, Music, I highly recommend it. It's such a good book. And it talks about her whole life. And, of course, she goes into the whole Throbbing Gristle drama show. I think, I, think they, I, I think that may even be being made into a series, like a limited series right now. If not, it's, if it is, it's going to be incredible. 
And of course, Genesis P, who sadly passed in the last few years, later became Genesis Briar Porridge, um, becoming a non-binary pandrogene with his second wife, uh, Lady J. And so after Throbbing Gristle broke up, Genesis P formed uh, Psychic TV along with Sleazy initially, um, and a fresh addendum of musicians. And I think Sleazy was only there for the first album. I don't think Sleazy was in the group when I saw them. So they were a newish band at the time of this gig, and I wasn't familiar with their meager output by that point. You know, I was just very stoked to see, you know, these throbbing gristle deportees and, you know, thrilled that the New York City trip overlapped with the Danceteria show. I had faith that it would be suitably, audaciously bizarre. Psychic TV did not disappoint on that front. Tapping into the psychedelic drones of Porge's younger, flower child years, but crossed with the willfully unnerving experimentation at the extremes of contemporary post-punk, I recall the evening as a hypnotic assault on the eyes, ears, and spirit. Long, dark, floaty meditations and a wonderfully trippy light show mark the performance from start to finish, merging with my own altered state as if in a dream on the edge of a nightmare, with that precipice ever threatening, but never tipping over. There was a malevolent thrust to the whole performance, like a paranoiac happening that was more exploding plastic inevitable at the Dom in 66 than Fillmore Hippie 67. It was more of an audio-visual audio visual sensory overload than a standard one song following another gig experience, substantially more compelling than the quickly tiring Circle Jerk show from the night before. Then as now, I think if I'm going to be that off my tits at a show on hallucinogens, then I picked the right show to be at. However... The strangest part of the set or night or encore or entire time in New York City occurred when I had to make a pit stop in the Danceteria bathroom to take a leak during the set. The bathrooms were near pitch black, so it was already an adventure enough just to get to the urinal, get my dick out, and aim it correctly. In the process of doing so, Something extraordinary happened. It's a hoary and generally inaccurate old cliche about taking psychedelics and, you know, having full-scale hallucinations, like your aloe vera plant suddenly sprouting ten feet tall in front of your eyes, or your cat morphing into Mason Reese. But it was in the Danceteria's opaque water closet with yours various, trying to hit the mark with my John Henry that I began to see a grid-like rectangle of luminous orange dots flashing, zooming at me at rapid succession. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Just blinking and flying right at me in this perfect grid. And the little creatures dang well just wouldn't stop pulsating at me. And since I was presently predisposed, I simply stood there and enjoyed the light show generated by the windmills of my mind and the cookies. Nothing like that had happened to me before or since. And I was alert enough and in the moment to realize that this was a once in a lifetime experience. So I simply observed and appreciated the event. To this day, that neat grid of flying dots is clear in my mind's eye. However, one can only take so much of unconsciously self-generated microstrobes, and it was an eventual relief to finally be able to zip up and walk back out to the relative norm of Psychic TV's Wagnerian psychodrama and community-shared visuals. All four of us night trippers seriously got off on the spectacle that was Psychic TV. Afterwards, we spent a few hours exploring Danceteria's variety of environs. At one point, I was up on the fourth floor. I noticed a 
partially open door leading to a back room. And I sort of peered in around the corner, and there is Genesis P sitting post-gig on a chair in conversation with someone. So I wasn't about to interrupt. You know, I was worried that he might cast a hex on me or something. So we blissed out on our continuing euphoria until pretty much closing time. And upon exiting, we foolishly decided to simply walk back to the hotel in the middle of the, of the night in 1980s Manhattan. That alone is a good advertisement of how hallucinogens can futz with logic. But eventually we gave up and flagged down a cab, just realizing we were too tired, or at least two of us were. Uh, I remember getting in laying down on the couch and conking right out um, in, on the pull-out bed. And Sky simultaneously went into his room and just passed right out. Not so for the still quite wired artist and Miss B, who briefly awoke me when re-entering the room at dawn. Turns out they were up for a bit of an adventure and ended up going out again and riding subway trains through the city and over into Brooklyn in the middle of the night just for kicks. So the gang of six reconvened early afternoon, making our way around the city on a gray Friday afternoon, doing some record shopping. Now that I think about this, this is wrong. What I'm talking about here, this is the Saturday but I've got it in my notes, so I'll read it then. This is the Saturday. Um, this is the next day. Um, and yeah, so, hmm. Yeah, I think this was us the next day. I think the four of us kind of just hung out or did whatever during the day. There was like a period there was mostly just, just the four of us. Now, as with MZ, the artist had a radio show on the campus station, CHRW, which I joined the following May. I actually found my first ever playlist for when I started on CHRW, and I posted that up uh, on, uh, actually on my Facebook page. I haven't got it on the site. I'll do that uh, with an upcoming post. So as with MZ, the artist had a radio show and he had this idea that he brought he brought a tape deck along, a recording tape deck along, um, to record people on the streets of New York. And his idea was he would edit all the different voices into sort of a uh, sound art montage. So he brought this portable deck out with him on the last two days and easily found plenty of vocal exhibitionists to orate at length into Mr. Microphone. But one person in particular sticks out in my mind all these years later, and that's a gentleman who referred to himself as Broadway Bob. Uh, now, Broadway Bob was a tall African-American fellow who told us a series of wholly unbelievable but decidedly entertaining stories about his life, past and present. The best bit was when he claimed that Brooke Shields was his wife, when we asked him where Brooke was, he said that he kept her under a bed at home and didn't let her out much. Poor Brooke. Um, we did some tune shopping again. This is the Saturday. I'm mixing some of the days up. This is the Saturday. And we went to both indie shops and larger stores. And, you know, the shocking bit is they're all gone now. Or most of the large ones are anyway. So, and also we were there for, it was the grand opening weekend of Tower Records, and there was a film crew present to capture the event. Now, you'll find out what MZ and MB did the next night. Again, we, MZ and MB only hung out with us the first night. For a lot of the other trip, they were doing their own thing. It was mostly just the four of us. But that last day, we did go out together because we were all going back that afternoon, and I remember the film crew approached MZ, but there is, she could do little more than sit woefully on the curb and hope not to toss her cookies. So I know that I picked up a few slabs of vinyl in New York City. And in, I remember going into an independent store. I walk in and they're playing Night Nurse, Gregory Isaac's Night Nurse again. But the only two I'm positive that I purchased during the trip 
um, was a just arrived import copy of the The's brand new album, Soul Mining, one of my favorite albums of that period, the 80s. I still play it. And I got probably one of the first copies to hit North America. I'd really been anticipating that. And also, that's where I bought my 12 inch copy of PIL's This Is Not a Love Song. So that's from the Saturday I'm mixing this up. I'll get back to the Saturday in a moment. So for the Friday, we, I think we all did get, we did actually meet up. The six of us met up in the room again, even though we did different things at night. And we celebrated, I, one thing I remember at one point, the refrigerator racks were used as musical instruments. I also remember, I, I can't why, a bunch of us picking up MZ and inexplicably throwing her in the shower and photographic evidence remains of this. And another memory I have is a really small memory of sitting on the couch and there was a window behind the couch. And when you turned around and looked out the window, you would see the top of the Empire State Building, all lit up uh, just a few blocks away. And I just found that very cool. And I was also thinking, well, there you go. I've seen a Warhol superstar uh, in the building, you know, the star of Empire. So eventually Eminem decided that they were heading out to CBGB's for the evening. And I don't know why the rest of us didn't go. Maybe this, we'd had enough with the circle jerks and hardcore and wanted something different, whatever. But they did their own thing yet again. And so what did the other four of us do on this final night on the town? Well, one thing we didn't do was get really high again as mo all of the herbal and most, uh, most what we had been taking was all gone. And all that was left were a few bennies, which don't really count, just kind of keep the energy going. So for now, it was just down to it being a liquid diet, something that myself, Miss B, and the artist were more than adept with. Uh, and also Marcel, who we talked about earlier, reconnected with us on this night uh, and hung out, but he laid low on the booze. And since we only now had the single intoxication stream, we were on a roll for the past few days, and the three of us were drinking even more than normal, and that is saying something for us in those days, my goodness. I rarely drink now, but let me tell you, I could hold my liquor. Uh, so anyway, Sky, however, was a different matter. As mentioned, he was heretofore resolutely teetotal. And so it came to pass that he chose this night, during a trip peppered with excess, to break his no-alcohol rule and start not only quaffing, but to try and keep up drink for drink with three people who were decidedly well-versed in imbibing alcohol. And if anything... We were committed to raising this already high benchmark on this final evening in the city, and Sky wanted to be right there with us. Bad idea. Seriously bad idea. Within a few hours, Sky was not only extremely drunk, but out of control. The sun left our sky as threatening clouds settled in for a night of stormy weather. He'd taken to repeating himself over and over, stumbling around and generally avoiding or unable to process any sense of reason we were trying to feed him. By this point, we were getting into mid to late evening and decided it was time to head out and find somewhere interesting to take the party but also figured that some fresh air and, you know, walking around would help him sober up, you know, and get him into a serviceable degree. Nope. Didn't happen. We, again, we were all experienced foot soldiers in the party wars in those days, you know, but for the most part, you know, again, we were used to it. We were able to keep it together. Uh, you know, even when we did overdo it, we tended to be silly kind of, drunk or sloppy people 
Not so with Sky, as we all came to very quickly di discover he was a really unpleasant drunk. Now, we made our way through the various neighborhoods with a dark sky upon us, loud and obnoxious, giddily confronting a train of decidedly unimpressed onlookers while frequently throwing his arms in the air to shout, Peace, love, and groove! Peace, love, and groove! Over and over and over and over at the top of his lungs. I particularly remember us walking through a bustling nighttime Greenwich Village with glowering gaggles of inflamed eyeballs staring daggers at us. Wordly wordlessly transmitting the message, shut him up or we'll kill you all. Now, what's, what became obvious and what's clear to me now is what we, we couldn't have known at the time, and maybe neither did Sky, but that he had some festering, serious mental health issues, and the booze just exacerbated this. You know, and again, this is stuff we just didn't know or know about uh, at this time people knew much less about mental and emotional health issues unlike today i mean we know and understand so much more about these things and it's clear to me now i'm now kind of wondering if the reason he didn't drink is this had happened before i don't know but what's clear to me now at the time was just like what the hell are you doing this is really bad. So we tried getting into a number of bars, including Danceteria, but in every single instance, the doorman would say, you three can come in, but not him. And I can't fault a single one of them for doing so. You know, and I'd also thrown around the suggestion of, <laughs> fittingly, on more than one front, going to see a late night screening of the underground movie du jour liquid sky but there is no way our sky would have been able to sit quietly and behave himself in a theater for two hours um, with all of that liquid and its effects streaming through him so somewhere around midnight you know after two hours of dead ends and walking around and nothing happening it became clear to us that we weren't going to be allowed in anywhere with Sky on board. And this whole thing about he just wasn't sobering up. We, we, hadn't, we hadn't been drinking. We couldn't get in anywhere. But he just wasn't sobering up and nothing was changing. So crestfallen, we jumped into a cab and headed back to the executive in a desultory mood. My, myself feeling especially angry that my last night in town and a Friday night at that in New York City had been squandered in such a way. So back at the, back at the suite, Sky just went into his room, just fell face down in and passed right out. Now, Miss B felt knackered and decided to call it a night. While Marcel, too, felt, okay, I've had enough for this evening, and he returned back to his room. So everyone was like, okay, well, the night's done, but not I. No way. There was no way I was going to spend Friday night and midnight in Manhattan in 1983 that the night's just getting started. There's no way I'm going to spend a Friday night sitting in a hotel room watching TV. And I decided then and there, I was heading back to Dan Ceteria and asked if anyone wanted to come. And the artist was right there with me. Uh, so we sort of had the last of the bennies and with our spirits flying, headed back downstairs, grabbed a cab, went to Dan Ceteria and headed right for the dance floor level. We spent hours there alternately hanging around or going our separate ways. We kind of did our own thing, but we kept running into each other. Um, and the music was fantastic. And again, on I don't know if there was one dance floor or more, but somebody played Night Nurse that night, and I remember dancing to it. So again, the, the song that followed me. Um, now, at one point, 
I was taking a breather and it was like this chill area or floor or whatever. But all I remember, it was kind of a place where people to sort of sit and they had these rows of banks of video screens. And of course, video in the early 80s, this was still fairly new, a new thing that was evolving. Uh, music videos, they'd been around a couple of years, um, but still not as, um, you know, blanketing the culture as they soon would, although, you know, that was already underway. But so anyway, I was sitting watching a succession of videos when this one video came on that really s struck a note with me. And it was a typically kind of cute for me at that time. Uh, cute most often being a term I employed derisively, unless we're talking about a dog or a pussycat. And it was kind of a straight up pop number, but it was really catchy. And it was delivered by this sort of wacky looking young woman in swaddles of thrift store garb and teased out hair, not looking a million miles away from our own Miss B. Now, in the video, she was complaining to her parents that she just wanted to have fun. Eventually, at the end, leading this sort of dancing train of prototypes of New York types through the streets of New York. Uh, and it just really stuck with me this video i don't know who it was i mean i was watching a whole pile of them i didn't know any of them they were all alternative videos and i remember mentioning this video that i'd seen at the club to several friends i remember telling um phil about it in particular um and i figured it's this video i'd seen once it was cute and i'd never see it again um well it didn't take long for everyone to see this video because about two months later uh, it exploded, and it turns out that the woman's name was Cindy Lauper, and the song was called Girls Just Want to Have Fun. And within a short time, that was culturally wallpapered uh, everywhere. So it was kind of neat to see it in advance uh, of it breaking. So we stayed there, danced. We were at the club till really late, and then finally it's like, okay, it's time to head back. We left Danceteria in the wee hours of Saturday morning with the stimulants wearing off, our energy depleting, and the knowledge that we had to be checked out by 10 a.m. or so, which was just a few hours away. This is, what, 3 or 4 in the morning, something like that. So the artist and I, you know, we jumped in a taxi, headed home, got to the hotel, headed up to the room, opened the door, and... What the hell? The two of us stood there, but the doorway to the suite momentarily stopped in our tracks with our mouths and eyes gaping, trying to process what we were seeing because the room had been utterly trashed. Okay, so it had been in a modest state of disarray before we left. And I mean, that's understandable, given that a bunch of young people had been camping out there, partying away for the few days, you know, admit all those shenanigans, but it had simply been a bit disordered. This was inexplicable to behold, leaving us briefly in shock by what lay in front of us. Furniture had been turned over, lamps lay askance with shades removed. Items were strewn around the room. Food and vomit were smeared across the walls and hotel items. A ripped out window screen was sitting on the floor and on it went. What the hell was going on? What had happened here? After being hit with that initial visual wallop, we realized that Miss B was curled up in a chair asleep under clothes amid the carnage, while Skye was asleep in the bedroom pretty much where we'd left him. So, shaking Miss B awake, just to find out what the hell had gone down, you know, the poor thing drowsily came to. You know, little did we know she'd only just been able to fall asleep after her extended ordeal, and then filled us in. It had gone like this. Moments after the artist and I headed out, Sky rose, bounding awake and out of bed, and proceeded to go on a rampage. 
Miss B said that it was as if he had gone totally mad, like even more so than earlier, with a craziness and intensity that went beyond anything we had witnessed earlier in the evening. Wow. At this point, our, you know, our, our, our thoughts turned to her personal safety. Are you okay? Um, but she said while he was aggressive, compulsive, and raging, he was never violent towards her, although it was pretty scary. He was just totally out of hand. So at one point, apparently, he'd gotten it into his head that it would be a great idea for him to toss this still sizable chunk of the side of a ham that he'd purchased out of the window of our top floor hotel room down onto Madison Avenue, hence why the screen was off one of the windows. And apparently he had the ham dangling from his hands at one point, his arms extended outside the window, and Miss B couldn't recall exactly how she did it or what she said, but she finally persuaded him against the spectacle of flying hams on Madison Avenue. Apparently after a while, it went on for quite a while, but he just exhausted himself again, crashed out of sleep, and he'd been there ever since. So it was now the middle of the night heading towards morning. We all had to be up and at him in a few hours. And so with everyone, you know, pretty exhausted and there's little that we could do, it was time just for us to get the sleep that we could. So the artist collapsed into his bed and I was careful to try to find somewhere to crash out for a few hours that wasn't vomit infested. All too soon... The blaring sun roused the three sets of blearing eyes while sky was gray and would not rise. Eminem had kipped out once again in the Zeppelin quarters and our shock and horror from the previous evening replayed itself in the morning when Eminem traipsed up to the suite to rejoin forces and discovered the visual pandemonium that was the destroyed rooms. So with soft skulls, leaden limbs and numble fingers we showered packed dressed and readied ourselves to head down to the lobby where everyone's luggage would be stored would be stored in a safe room until the dinner time bus arrived to take us back to londonia now we tried jostling sky amid his mewling and mumbling but it wasn't happening he just was not getting up Ergo, we had to leave him in the room, knowing that, you know, he'd have to rise or shine within the next few hours because cleaning staff would be coming in. And of course, this is all before cell phones and any of that. So we checked our luggage um, and we, you know, the, the, the rest of us, the quintet, beelined it for the requisite greasy breakfast with life-saving caffeine before spending our final day in the city and wandering around shopping. And again, part of it was that record shopping I talked about earlier. Now, it was a gorgeously sunny and a typically warm late November Saturday as we walked about. And we were making our way through the Bowery um, when New York City's thoughtful citizenry presented itself to us once again. Both M and M were major fan, were both major fans of the Stranglers, and MZ was wearing an official band jacket with their name emblazoned across the back, accompanied by their logo, the Rat. So this guy in his twenties stops us. Uh, it may have even been I can't remember where, but he stopped us and he sort of you know said to MZ, "So the Stranglers, like what's?" what's this about? What are the Stranglers? And she said, oh, you know, they're a band from England. And he said, ah, okay, okay. Well, I decided to stop you folks as you don't look like you're from around here. And uh, just thought I'd let you know that to most people in this area, it looks like you're wearing a gang jacket. Uh, If one of the gangs in your area sees you wearing it, they'll probably beat the shit out of all of you. Uh, (laughs) Thank you, kind New Yorker. Noted much appreciated on that one and uh, off went the jacket for now the stranglers tucked away to come out and play another day so again we bought the records but in general i really kept all my i made all my purchases on this last afternoon because that way i mean really i wanted money for going out and doing things although i did want to buy some things i thought i'll keep my money 
till just before we're going because then I know what I'm dealing with because I had some ideas for purchases. Uh, one of the coolest things I bought and which I had for years until it fell apart was this very sharp vintage 50s Silvertex uh, suit jacket. And I bought that at the legendary Trash and Vaudeville on St. Mark's Place, still going strong. And man, I wore that jacket regularly over the next few years, often in tandem with this hot pink shirt with sort of narrow black collars and this pair of sort of 50s zoot suity gray and pepper pants that I'd raided from the back of my father's closet. It's a pair he had from the 50s. And that kind of look was one I wear a lot in the mid, uh, mid 80s. Now, the other big item that was on my to buy list that I did was my very first Walkman. Then as now, I love new technology. And as a music nut to boot, I highly coveted Walkmans at this time. They were relatively new and just starting to explode as a widely purchased consumer device. Now, I was pretty cash poor through much of the 80s, particularly at this point, and couldn't afford you know, what stores in London, Ontario were charging for them. And I sort of reckoned that um, I could get a cheap, I could get a Walkman much cheaper in New York. And I was right. In one of my few times spent totally by myself in the city, I headed out for a few hours um, and headed down to the good old bad and sleazy pre disney Times Square and got one for about 20 or $25, I think. It was about a third of what I was going to pay here back home in London. And anticipating that Walkman purchase, I brought some tapes along with me. So in terms of walking back to meet everyone at the hotel for the bus, um, I have this vivid memory of walking around Times Square, listening to Prince's Lady Cab Driver off 1999, before heading back and meeting up with the gang in front of the hotel for us to retrieve our luggage and head to the bus. The other one I remember listening to was actually UB40's Labor of Love, and they are coming up next in the My Life in Concert series. More on that later. As for Sky, he'd had a blue day indeed. Uh, not long after we'd left, he was half awake enough to register that a cleaning lady entered the room, saw the devastation, let out a yelp, and then ran back out. He said a few minutes later, the door burst open and a few burly hotel staff roughly dragged Sky out of bed and generally uh, flipped out on the disoriented lad with the splitting skull. He was made to clean the entire room himself and was not let out until he had done so to their specifications. Pretty brutal experience um, that sent him right back into teetotal land after that. However, he got out in the afternoon. He did do some sightseeing alone. And now, as with the rest of us, we were ready for a break from the madness of the past few days, looking forward to a quiet trip home and some downtime. Or at least most of us wanted this. And if you have heard my episode on Police Picnic 82, episode 17, well, that's a bit of a precursor to this trip. That's a two nightmare bus rides. What happened was this. Our new acquaintance, Marcel, who had remained the essence of sobriety and understatement while hanging out with us degenerates, decided that since the trip was now over, and he no longer had the desire to keep his memory banks sharp, he would shift into party boy mode at this moment on what was supposed to be the quiet trip home. Marcel proceeded to down a large bottle of vodka, sans chaser, on the bus throughout the first portion of the trip. I had wanted to try and sleep on the way back, and so my seat buddy from the way down, Miss B, went and sat with Marcel so that I could try stretching out a bit more uh, for some exhaustion-fueled shut-eye. Unfortunately, poor Miss B went two for two, 
having to directly deal with yet another out-of-control drunken madman as the formerly low-key Marcel became a shouting, unhinged lunatic. As with Sky the night before, logic and sanity left the Marcel building as he alternated repeatedly shouting and chanting, Pterodactyl! Manifestation! Pterodactyl! Pterodactyl! Manifestation! Pterodactyl! Manifestation! Pterodactyl! Manifestation! Pterodactyl! Manifestation! Manifestation! Pterodactyl! At no one in particular, while occasionally changing up the act by screaming verbal abuse at the bus driver. Miss B tried once again to be the petite voice of calm and reason to someone flying right off the mental rails with less successful results of this time. Not only did everyone on the bus, who wanted nothing more than this trip to be positively smothered in Zamfir-like tranquility, each want to personally strangle Marcel with their bare hands, the beleaguered bus driver eventually pulled over to the side of the road, halfway home, stopped the bus, and then threatened to abandon it and all of us if we didn't shut Marcel up. Now, while I don't in any way blame this put-upon driver for being angry at having to shoulder this uncalled-for abuse, it wasn't our fault that Marcel had suddenly turned into a drunken Liam Gallagher and we were all the more ready to slap the dickens out of the bugger ourselves! Surely, it should have been Marcel who found himself fetching a new roadside home and not the rest of us. Anyway, somehow, perhaps owing to a threat of group violence? I don't know. Marcel toned it down a bit after that, eventually manifesting and pterodactyling himself unconscious. We did all indeed make it back home. Finally spending most of the next few days in chill and slippers mode, reveling in what a wild ride it had been. The trip also had a multi-pronged legacy for us. For starters, we'd made a new pal on the artist, who would be at UWO for a while yet, and will figure in some of the upcoming entries. In getting to know the artist, we also got to know some of his community of friends too, with further social, act social act interactions taking place. So it kind of opened up my social world further, and it was really good. And also, Sky also remained intermittently in the picture as he came up from Toronto you know, to visit the artist a number of times. Unfortunately, his mental health issues began to deepen, take their toll, and really presented himself and his family with some really tough situations and his eventual institutionalization before we lost contact completely. Then there's Marcel. Now, after initially losing contact upon return, the artist ran into him at a, a screening of a Three Stooges retrospective at the New Yorker, and this happened just prior to a planned meetup with us later that night, uh, starting out at a Christmas party at MZ's. So the artist brought him along, and voila. Now, while Marcel, Marcel sort of floated in and out of our orbit for the next year or so, the real legacy was that he and his bus ramblings inspired um, an intermittently ongoing sound and later music and video slash humor heavy sound art project, highly ridiculous. Um, and it's a willfully ridiculous, parodic, conceptual nonsense uh, among a shifting collective of us that exists in various forms as Marcel and the Pterodactyls. Uh, now that's Marcel as the New York dude that we met and Duchamp. And hey, we've even had college radio play in uh, a few countries over the last 30 years. So not most of it isn't music per se, but more like arty audio nonsense. Um, so anyway, so there are, uh, there's a lot of twisted ludicrousness. There is a Marcel on the Pterodactyls channel with videos. So check it out if you're so inclined, but be warned. Oh, 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 and that flea bag hotel we stayed at? 
It was purchased one year later by former Studio 54 whiz kids Steve Rubell and Ian Schrager, transforming it from the executive pumpkin that it was into the sleek boutique Cinderella that soon became the very first Morgan's Hotel. So times were changing, but I'm so glad that I got to experience the old New York the down and dirty New York before it was fully neutered and disnified. I mean, I still love New York, but it was incredible. It was a totally different place. And I don't care. I prefer the old Times Square. But anyway, that's me. Well, this concludes my fond remembrance of those fun-filled and eventful few days in New York City. Uh, This also wraps up my look at live shows from 1983, the year when my gig-going and music community involvement really exploded, although there are a few more shows from um, that year that will be discussed uh, and coming up in a compilation episode. This New York City episode will be my last for some time that will feature only me, as I have a number of guests lined up for the next eight or nine entries in the series, including some uh, new guests to the series who you've not heard before so lots is coming up and what is coming up next in the series i am jumping back further into the past as i look at a show that happened between my first and second official gigs and those i've both looked at and those gigs namely being roxy music at the london arena on february 5th 1975 which i looked at in episode two And the second show, Bob Seger at the London Gardens on May 19th, 1978, which I discussed in podcast episode 7, with both shows happening here in London, Ontario, Canada. Now, there was actually a cabaret show in between those two official concerts that I saw in Portsmouth, England, in August 1977 with my parents. And it featured early 60s popster Susan Mon, she of the 1962 hit Bobby's Girl, and possibly the legendary Tessie O'Shea. And again, because this show, it's not a full sort of live music concert, but it had live music elements. So I'm going to revisit it for the podcast. Now, I had initially intended it to be part of an upcoming compilation episode uh, slated for concert slot number 29, Rock This Town, etc., Roundup Number 1, uh, where I'm going to be doing more encapsulated reviews of some, or, some other shows from this period where I haven't done a full uh, podcast. Um, but I have decided to make this one a standalone episode. And part of the reason why is the episode's special guest, who is my 96-year-old mother. We'll call her Vera, various artists, who attended the cabaret along with me and my late father. Now, my mom shares her vague memories of the evening, including that she feels that the legendary Tessie O'Shea was on the bill. Now, I know other people were on the bill. I can't remember them. I probably wouldn't have known who Tessie O'Shea was at the time. But if my mother's right, oh boy, because I sure as hell know who she is now. Now, we do both remember, uh, aside from Susan Mon, uh, humorous Pam Ayers and the famous people players also being part of the show, the cabaret. Now, my mother also recalls the venue itself, the Portsmouth Hippodrome, but also the King's Theater in Southsea. Uh, because she grew up in Petersfield, but later moved to Portsmouth after marrying my dad, and both my elder siblings uh, were born there in Portsmouth. During the interview, she discusses listening to the radio as well as records in the UK as a girl in the 1930s, and also music and live shows she enjoyed after moving to Canada in the mid-50s and onwards, and shows they they saw in the UK. And I also talk about my experiences on this trip in the ultimate UK punk year, 1977, amid the Queen's Silver Jubilee. So tune in for dangerous radio batteries, hanging out in British record stores to hear the latest releases, what double album of my mother's drove me nuts in the 70s, punk rock mania, 
not seeing the Sex Pistols, and what was Ethel Merman really like live? That's all coming up in episode 31, concert number 1.5, entitled UK 1977. VA's mum on Ethel Merman and Susan Mon at the Portsmouth Hippodrome and the music of her life. Plus, my UK trip amid the year of the punk rock explosion and Silver Jubilee. I'm so glad I got to interview my mum about all this, so be sure to come back next time. Obviously, it will not be featuring the type of shenanigans that took place on the New York City trip featured in this episode and also the aforementioned ub40 shows that i discussed earlier they're coming up as episode 32 so there there's a great interview coming up with uh phil robinson returning and uh sky sylvain making her debut in the podcast so stick around for that one i'd like to remind folks to please remember to like follow subscribe and hit the notification bell where applicable on our Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram pages. And please leave your memories of any of the gigs I'm writing about on the platform of your choice. And finally, if you've enjoyed the podcast, be sure to tell your Toonhead friends about the sprightly and satisfying experience that is mylifeinconcert.com. Tell your stoner Aunt Susan Tell your dithering but music-obsessed Uncle Napoleon. Tell your music-obsessed cat, Twinkles. Tell the live music junkies in your life. But for heaven's sake, just tell them about the magic of the MyLifeInConcert.com podcast. I'd like to say a big thanks to listeners both new and returning for taking the time to tune in. This is your host, Various Artists, Signing off, and we'll meet up at the next concert. See you then, and see you there. Bye for now. Yeah.